So friends, Second Chronicles chapter 26, and I'm going to read the whole chapter, so beginning at verse 1. And all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. He went out and made war against the Philistines and broke through the war of Gath and the war of Jabna and the war of Ashdod. And he built cities in the territory of Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbal and against the Moonites. And the Ammonites paid tribute to Azariah And his fame spread even to the border of Egypt, for he became very strong. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the angle and fortified them. And he built towers in the wilderness and cut out many cisterns, for he had large herds, both in the Shephelah and in the plain. And he had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of soldiers, fit for war in divisions according to the numbers in the muster made by Jael the secretary and Messiah the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's commanders. The whole number of the heads of father's houses of mighty men of valor was 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307,500 who could make war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Isaiah prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, uh, bows, and stones for slinging. In Jerusalem, he made machines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, he grew proud. To his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest went in after him with eighty priests of the Lord who were men of valor, and they withstood King Azariah and said to him, It's not for you, Azariah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Isaiah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah, Azariah the chief priests and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. And King Isaiah was a leper to the day of his death, and being a leper lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Isaiah from first to last, Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote, and Isaiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the burial field that belonged to the kings, for they said, he is a leper. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. Humility is a virtue that by definition, no one can take pride in having achieved. The lack of it can be indeed humorous. The story goes a woman who after hearing a pastor preach a fiery sermon calling for repentance, went up to him afterwards in the vestibule and uh, told uh, the pastor that she had not sinned for 25 years. The pastor quickly replied, you must be very proud about that, to which she unselfconsciously said, well, actually, I am. I believe it was C.S. Lewis who famously defined humility as not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less very helpful definition, 
But I've always loved how Charles Spurgeon introduced the topic of humility in an article he once wrote for his church magazine that he entitled, Humility and How I Achieved It. It is a slippery virtue, humility, difficult to define, and easy to lampoon is its opposite pride. But all that being said, the lack of humility is disastrous. The great teacher of spiritual disciplines, William Law, once said, pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. Well, my friends, the passage we're looking at this morning warns us of pride and woos us to humility. Let's remind ourselves of the context. So we've been in this series a little while, but we're picking up again. It's one book, actually original. In, in, the, in, the, in the original, the title in the Hebrew is The Words of the Days, which is a good way of thinking of this book, The Words of the Days. And its date, it was written uh, right after they returned from exile. It is indeed the last book of the Hebrew Bible. And the last sentence of the last book of the Hebrew Bible is incomplete to tell us that it lands in the end at the feet of Jesus. The repeated key word is seek, and there are two central messages in the book, which is the high point of the story of God's people in the Old Testament, God's word to David, and then Solomon's response to God's God's word. We're past that now. We're at the time when the kings are both good and bad, and before they end up being almost entirely bad. The structure of the book of Chronicles is answering, this is a helpful way of looking at it, basically three questions. Where do we come from? Where are we going? And how do we get there? It has a theme. The theme is uh, a homiletic history of God's people from Adam until the exile, written after the return from exile, showing that God's promised kingdom to King David's son forever is fulfilled ultimately in uh, the son of David still to come, that is, in in the name of Jesus. And it has an aim to encourage, exhort, and to lead God's people to expect the fulfillment of God's promise in Jesus. And uh, we've uh, seen, haven't we, that uh, it's very practical. It has a number of practical matters that are addressed, and we've gone through them. And uh, last time we were in Chronicles, we were answering whose battle is it? And this morning, the power of humility. First of all, there are three ways this story woos us to humility, and then there are three ways it warns us of pride. First of all, Humility focuses on what God wants. The Chronicle tells us that Isaiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now we know by the end of the story that Isaiah is proud, but here he is humble. Humility, biblically defined, is about what is doing right in the eyes of the Lord. And as I mentioned earlier, that famous definition from C.S. Lewis that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less is very helpful, but we need to take it a step further. Humility is thinking of God. It is a self-forgetfulness that can only come with a God-fullness. The great preacher G. Campbell Morgan defined the opposite of humility, pride, as follows. He said, pride of heart is that attitude that thinks it can get along without God. It's a wonderful definition. If that's the case, our culture, our society is filled with pride. It thinks it can get along without God. And if that is true, as I think it is self-evidently, then humility, pride's opposite, is by definition the attitude of heart that thinks that it cannot get along without God, that we need God, that we're doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. That's humility. Not in the eyes of culture, not in the eyes of your friends, not in the eyes even of a mentor, but in the eyes of God. We should add then what humility is not. Furthermore, it is not therefore weakness. It is not passivity. Passivity is not humility. It's just passivity. Humility is not having a negative self-image. That's not humility. That's just having a negative self-image. Humility, indeed, we might say, is reality. 
It is saying that God is God and we are not. That's humility. Isaiah started well. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And of course, we must ask ourselves this question as we begin. Are we aiming to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord? That is humility. Second, humility means seeking and fearing God. Verse 5, he uh, sought God and it was in the fear of God. The text explains to us further what humility means in practice therefore so if in principle humility is doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord what does that mean in practice well the text tells us it means seeking God and fearing God we will remember that seeking God is a key theme for the whole book of Chronicles and to seek God means praying, but not just saying prayers. It means seeking God in prayer, crying out to God, waiting on God. It is seeking God like the early disciples waited in Jerusalem for the power of the Spirit from on high. That is to seek God, to ask for God's Spirit to fill you, for God's Spirit to move powerfully in this church. That is to seek God. It's looking to Him, actively asking him calling upon him and humility that is definitionally doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord in principle leads then in practice to seeking God but it also leads in practice to fearing God note will you that it note will you that it is Zechariah who other than this little bit in the Bible is otherwise unknown but Zechariah who instructed Uzziah in the fear of God in other words, the fear of God is something we must learn. It is not intrinsic to us. It is not natural to us. It must be taught, and we must learn it. It is not easy for a disciple to grasp what it means to live in the fear of God. It is learned through the right teaching of God's Word. It is something that comes by instruction. Now, to fear God is different whether you are an unbeliever in the Lord God or a believer. To fear God for the unbeliever, someone who hasn't put their trust in Jesus, what does that mean? It is rightly to be terrified of final judgment and so run into the arms of Jesus. It would be a wise thing, if you're not yet a believer here, to fear God in that sense, to be terrified of his holiness and his justice and therefore run into the arms of Jesus to save you. Hell is a fearful doctrine. Eternal punishment is a fearful reality. And if you're not a believer, by all means, fear God and put your faith in Christ to be saved this morning, here and now. But it's different to fear God as a believer. A believer who calls God Father, the fear of God does not mean to be terrified of God. But nor, nor does it merely mean, as it is often said, to mildly respect God. To fear God for the believer means a loving, trembling desire to please God above all. We might put it like this, to fear God for the believer is to put the awe back in the awesome. Our God is an awesome God and it is to put the awe back in the awesome. It means that God is not trivialized. It means that God is magnified. It means having a big God theology. The story is told of the great preacher, great American preacher, Donald Barnhouse. One time when he was a young man just beginning his preaching ministry, he went back to preach at the uh, seminary that had trained him. I think it was Gordon Conwell that I may get where he was trained incorrect, but I think it was there. And he went back to preach in the chapel and much to his consternation, as he began to preach, right on the front row was his sitting there eagerly waiting for him to preach was his much revered Hebrew preacher. So you can imagine that as a young man, you go back to preach in your college chapel and right in the front row is this much respected, honored, revered, great Hebrew teacher. And he's preaching away and he, at the end of the, of the sermon, the Hebrew teacher comes up to Donald Barnhouse as a young man who became a great preacher and he said to him this, I am glad that you are a big godder. And Donald Barnhouse said, well, what do you mean by that? 
And the Hebrew uh, professor carried on like this. Well, when my boys come back to preach in chapel, I like to listen to them to discover whether they are little godders or big godders. You are a big godder, he said, and your ministry will be blessed. And he walked away. Are you a big godder? Do you have a big god? Well, finally, in these first three ways that this passage is wooing us to humility, we see what it produces. Humility leads to prosperity, fame, and strength. Verse five, God made him prosper. Verse 15, his fame spread far till he was strong. So if in principle, humility is doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord, And if in practice, humility means seeking and fearing God, what does this humility then produce? And our text carries on to tell us that it produces prosperity, fame, and strength. Now, we need to note again that we're reading the Old Testament. Jesus tells us in the New Testament that we must pick up our cross and follow him. Because we are not a theocratic state in the New Testament age, there is no direct correlation between humility and political or fiscal prosperity. And even in the Old Testament, read the book of Job, and there you discover a righteous man who was humble before God and feared God and yet suffered greatly. The truth is we live in a fallen world And so the correlation between fearing God and uh, fiscal prosperity is by no means always a one-to-one correlation. In fact, the so-called prosperity gospel that you may have heard of is either an under-realized eschatology, that is, it's thinking we still live in the Old Testament age, or it's an over-realized eschatology, that is, it thinks we live in the age that is still to come. The truth is, we Christians, we live in the now and the not yet. And all the fruits of the final age have not yet come upon us. Nonetheless, for the follower of Jesus today, humility does still produce wonderful fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be a complete game changer if we in this city lived in the fear of God and we were filled with that kind of fruit? Wouldn't it be a total game changer if the church of God in America lived in the fear of God and was filled with that kind of fruit? Is that what we're seeing? No, it's not what we're seeing. Why are we not seeing it? Because we're not living in the fear of God. We're filled with pride, not with humility. We must also add that in general terms, a people that fear God uh, and uh, 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 are therefore as biblically defined humble, living to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, will tend towards great practical fruit as well. Proverbs 14 verse 34 says this, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We cannot be surprised if our nations and our peoples are crumbling around us when we are filled with pride and sin. For righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If we wish to, be, uh, to be, uh, have uh, biblically categorized New Testament versions of, of this Old Testament blessing that the, the fear of God produces, that is the fruit of the Spirit, Be humble. Be humble in principle, in practice, and for what it produces, the glory of God. And if that's not enough, we're also warned in this text to not fall into the trap of the reverse. It warns us, having wooed us to humility in three ways, it now warns us against pride in three ways. First, pride comes from strength and destroyed, and destroys. Verse 16. Uh, when, he was, uh, uh, when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. Is that so often the case? Someone is blessed greatly, they grow strong, and then they begin to become pride, proud, and then they fill into, into destruction. While Isaiah started so well, he ended poorly. And this last part of the story is a warning to all of us here 
who may feel that we're doing well. Be careful if you think you stand, lest you fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Why? Strength tends towards pride, and pride generates destruction. The Hebrew for the word proud has a root sense of high, lifted up, can be used as a neutral sense, describing someone as tall, or it can be even used positively of someone whose heart was courageous. Here, obviously, it means high in the sense of haughty, high and mighty, or proud. How do we avoid strength leading to pride and then pride leading to destruction? The answer is to keep our eyes on pleasing God. Realizing that whatever we have achieved is not what we have achieved but what God has done for you. That means gratitude is a protector against pride. It is God who did it. We're grateful. We are only unworthy servants, as Jesus told us to say at the end when we are commended. We are only unworthy servants. But his pride led to his unfaithfulness. Verse 16, one scholar called Selman said this about that word. It's the most important expression for sin in the book of Chronicles. And then it becomes a regular feature as the decay that comes from this pride increasingly falls upon the people of God. Increasing unfaithfulness. Take this warning seriously. Are you strong? Are you strong at home? Be careful. Are you strong at work? Be careful. Are you strong academically or intellectually? Be careful. Are you strong religiously? Be careful. Or rather, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on His eyes and on what pleases Him. And then it warns us that pride is often revealed in anger. Verse 19, He became angry. So how do we know we are proud? Pride is a bit like an invisibility cloak that masks other vices. How do you know? Well, he became angry. It was a tell. It does not mean that all anger is a sign of pride. Far from it. There is a kind of anger that is righteous. Uh, we're told in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, in your anger do not sin, and therefore there are some kinds of anger that are not sinful, Anger is not always a wrong emotion, it's just always a dangerous emotion. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Also, some are angry because they have been wronged. It does little good to tell someone who's been unjustly treated not to be angry about the unjust treatment. Better to tell them to channel that righteous anger into something productive, to give back, to advance the gospel. That said, anger can, as it was here, be a sign of pride. For the humble person is usually happy to receive rebuke if it comes from a righteous person and if the rebuke is righteous itself, not casting blame on a victim of injustice. So let me say this. If you are experiencing anger, ask yourself whether you are angry because of something righteous or angry because of something like what Isaiah had done. He had stepped over a God-given boundary. It was the secular power trying to control the religious. One scholar said, put it like this, to burn incense to the Lord on the inner altar, he entered the temple, uh, Solomon when he burned incense did it outside in the courtyard, for him to burn incense to the Lord on the inner altar was not right for Isaiah, only for consecrated priests. He crossed over the boundary. He was using his secular authority to try and dominate the, the religious authority. And then when he's told off by Azariah, he doesn't like it, he gets angry. So whether you're dealing with pride or not is ultimately a question between you and God. Uh, Psalm 139 verse 24 puts it like this, show me if there's any unrighteous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Will you pray that? Show me, if you're dealing with anger at something else, show me if there's any unrighteous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Again, it doesn't mean all anger is wrong. The great reformer Martin Luther said he never wrote or preached well unless he was angry. 
There is a place for fiery zeal, but be careful that the fire stays in the fireplace. The final warning against uh, pride uh, tells us this. If I can get it to come up. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working. That's quite interesting. Well, I'll just tell you anyway. Oh, there it is. Pride ultimately excludes us from God's presence. Verse 21, he's excluded from the house of the Lord. Well, did Isaiah repent? We have no record of it, though to my knowledge, we have no absolute proof that he did not repent either. It may be symptomatic of the issue that perhaps what Isaiah is most famous for is his death. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, in the year that Isaiah died, Isaiah has his famous vision of God. It certainly behooves us to be gracious to him. Perhaps he did repent, though he lived out the remainder of his days separated from the presence of God symbolized by the house of God. One commentator called Alan put it like this, even in his burial, his royal rank stands in question for he's laid to rest not in the royal cemetery, but in crown property adjoining it. It's, it's unsure. Separation from God now and eternally, we know though for sure, is the fruit of pride. If we reject God, he honors our choice. If we say, we don't want you, God, then our choice he will honor. What a terrible thing it is to be too proud to listen to God. Too proud to learn from someone younger than you or someone older than you or someone of a different background or race from you if they're bringing God's truth to you. Too proud to listen to a word from God. Stand, my friends, let's replace pride with passion, passion for Christ and his gospel. Well, the power of humility. Humility focuses on what God wants. It means seeking and fearing God. It leads to prosperity, fame, and strength. The Chronicle is wooing us to humility. Don't believe the lie that being humble is somehow being passive or having negative self-talk. It, it means focusing your eyes on what is pleasing in God's eyes. And in practice, therefore, it means seeking God and fearing God. At least this abundant fruit. Be humble. Seek God. Seek to do what pleases Him. And be warned against pride. It comes from strength, a self-sufficiency, and will destroy. It's often revealed in unrighteous anger, and ultimately it excludes us from God's presence. In May of uh, 2018, Johanna Gisahal went to a local tattoo shop in Kirkult, Sweden. She wanted the names of her two children tattooed onto her arm and intertwined together. But once the tattoo was done, Johanna looked at her arm to discover to her surprise the name of one of her children, Kevin, had been misspelt as Calvin. What to do? Well, instead of trying to change that tattoo, another difficult, expensive, and uncertain procedure, perhaps she took what to her seemed the easier route and changed the name of her son. <laughs> so at two years of age, Kevin became Calvin. It's an interesting illustration of pride. Pride is the attempt to change the word of God to suit our own tattooed version. Humility is instead bringing our lives into line with his word. And such humility comes with a passion to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord as Isaiah began. He wanted to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He was passionate about it. Such a passion would shake our lives, shake our communities, shake our churches, and shake our world. On June the 17th, 2018, Mexico defeated the defending champions Germany in the Soccer World Cup that year. At the same time, in Mexico City, scientists recorded a small earthquake on the Richter scale. Later, they discovered that the small earthquake was not a geological event, but the result of mass jumping by passionate soccer fans. <laughs> Let me ask you this. 
What would be the earth-shaking consequences if we all had the passionate humility to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord? Let's bow our heads and pray together. Our Father God, we do ask that we would have that passionate, earth-shaking humility, that we would do what is right in your eyes. We pray, Lord, that we would not be filled with pride as a people, but instead so focus on you, so focus on what is good in your eyes, that we would seek you, we would fear you, and that by your Spirit and your grace, you produce wonderful, bountiful spiritual fruit in our lives, in our churches, and in our families and communities. And we pray these things for the glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen.